Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. Um, and I'm with the Carleton University um, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. And in this video, I'm going to continue uh, my discussions on this particular paper by Martin Wilde. It's Decadal Changes in Radiative Fluxes at Land and Ocean Surfaces and their relevance for global warming. So I'm gonna be talking about radiative balances, so sunlight coming in, long wave radiation going out, uh, global warming, the effect of aerosols, how they block sunlight, um, how they change the nature of clouds through uh, making clouds brighter, the Tuomi effect, and also making clouds uh, live longer, the effects of black carbon I've also discussed, how they actually cause global dimming, but they also cause warming at the same time. Uh, global warming and global dimming simultaneously if the particles are black carbon versus sulfur dioxide, which would cause the global dimming and a cooling of the surface. So continuing this series of videos, um, Martin Wilde has done a lot of work in this particular area. So if we look at the fluxes, at the land and the ocean surfaces, then they depend on the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They depend on things in the atmosphere that block sunlight, like aerosols and clouds of various types. But they also um, look at the interactions. Uh, you know, if a cloud is, if a aerosol cloud is blocking light, that's very, very different from if it's reflecting light. If it's blocking light and absorbing that energy, it's warming the atmosphere, causing global warming. If it's reflecting the light, then it's uh, causing uh, cooling. Um, in both cases, there's global dimming. Hope I got that right. So, anthropogenic, that's human-caused interference with climate is mostly through modification of radiative fluxes. So, greenhouse gases, they enhance thermal radiation, which is long wave, wave radiation from the atmosphere to the surface by two watts per square meter per decade. So we get the global warming, okay? But it's not just thermal radiation that has large changes at the surface. It's also the incident solar radiation, SSR, surface solar radiation, which is in line with changes in aerosol emissions. So more aerosols in the atmosphere lower SSR, which is the global dimming, which doesn't necessarily mean cooling. Like I said, it depends on the nature of the aerosols, whether it's cooling or warming. So land-based observations, we had declines in SSR, widespread, less solar radiation at the surface, 1950s, actually 1940s to, to 1980s, global dimming. A partial recovery since the mid-1980s, global brightening, and there was early brightening in the 30s and 40s. Okay, we don't have these records over oceans. These are terrestrial records. However, we can model the air movement over the ocean. This is in the lower atmosphere, the troposphere. Particles are rained out in about a week, but the air can be moving over the oceans, causing the same sort of effects over the oceans. So we get a modulation of the greenhouse gas warming by the aerosol effects. So in the northern hemisphere, lack of warming from the 50s to 80s, acceleration in the 90s, it fits to the reversal from dimming to brightening, uh, and that can be correlated to changes in air pollution levels. Okay, um, and we can look at the effects between the land and the ocean. Okay, so these radiative fluxes basically determine um, the energy balances at the surface. So, you know, we have, we have the global warming from greenhouse gases, we have glacier retreat, changes in water availability, change, so precipitation, um, regime changes, um, and, you know, so what we're doing here in this paper is they looked at the amount of solar radiation reaching the earth, and of course that is important for agriculture pr uh, production, solar power generation, you know, looking up, seeing a nice clear blue sky, etc. Okay, so, so it talks about the data. So here's some early data 
This is Potsdam, Germany. This is the surface solar radiation in watts per square meter measured at the surface. And what we see is we, saw, we see an increase here up to about 1950. And then we see the decrease here. Um, okay, a decrease up to about 1980. So global dimming here. So we have early brightening, we have dimming here, and then we have brightening here. Okay, so this is what the data is showing in Potsdam. Let's go to some other diagrams. Um, let's just go down, look at the pictures. That's what, you know, I can come back to some of the details. So this is the diurnal temperature range, DTR, daily temperature range. Um, and this is a year, this is when we had the brightening, the dimming, and the brightening. So what we can see is this is the anomaly um, average over the Northern Hemisphere from 1900 to 2013. So we can see, um, you know, when, it was, when there was brightening, that would mean that the daily temperature range, diurnal temperature range would increase because, if there's, because at night, the, the short long wave radiation can radiate up to space. So nothing's trapping it in or less is blocking it in. So the temperature is lower at night and the sky is clearer, less aerosol, so the temperature is, uh, the, the, the daily highs are higher. So the daily, diurnal temperature range is larger, increasing here. You know, when we get dimming, we get the opposite effect. When we get dimming, the nights are warmer, they don't get as cold, and the days don't get as warm, so the daily temperature range, the difference between those two numbers, decreases here. And then we get this uh, brightening effect again. Okay, and we definitely saw this effect um, of uh, brightening um, after 9-11 when the plane stopped flying the contrails weren't being created for three days we saw an increase in the daily uh, the DTR by actually by one degree Celsius you know which is way off in the scale okay um, so going back uh, so let's go to the next diagrams um, you know, they talk about the role, they try to tease out basically the role of the aerosols blocking the radiation um, and the aerosols creating clouds, the longevity and reflectivity of the clouds. There's lots of details in here, but I want to get to the, the key points. I don't want to get bogged down into the details. They also try to tease out the effect of terrestrial versus ocean. You know, what happens in the two different regions. Uh, so let's go down and have, a, I'm trying to find the diagrams. Okay, so here we go. Um, this is the downward thermal radiation um, over, uh, over a couple decades here, I guess. And it shows that the downward thermal radiation is increasing. Okay, um, and this is at the South Pole. Okay, so we're seeing an increase of, of uh, downward thermal radiation um, and causing warming at the uh, surface. Okay, uh, let's go back. This is the diagram that I wanted to sh come, that I wanted to find, that I was looking for. So this breaks down the temperature rise globally at two meters, so just at surface stations um, in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. So clearly note that the, the, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, which is a polluted hemisphere, lots of aerosols being created from 58 to 85, we had a decline of minus 0 0.02 degrees Celsius per decade. Okay, so the aerosols were building up, industry was advancing uh, post-war, and the sky was, not, uh, was causing uh, so there was more sulfur dioxide that which was swamping out the black carbon effect which have caused warming so we had a decline here i think the decline is about 0.1 degree or so um and i believe um it doesn't look maybe it was 0.1 from from a previous uh, paper um the idea that global warming caused 0.4 increase uh, global dimming caused a minus 0 0.5 decrease. Add those together, you get about minus 0 0.1, you get a decline here. And then 
when there was less aerosols, uh, less of the sulfur dioxide in the aerosols, and the temperature took off um, and increased 0.24 degrees Celsius per decade from 85 to 2014, which is what we see. So we're seeing a large increase in global warming rate. It's not all from greenhouse gases. It's also from less sulfur dioxide um, from the, in the aerosols. It's also uh, lots of black carbon, um, which, uh, you know, after CO2, the global warming potential uh, effect of black carbon, as we noted previously, was 4,000 um, over a 40-year period. So a massive, uh, if a massive increase of, of that, and we're seeing more black carbon on the glaciers and the poles, we're seeing it on mountain glaciers, and it's dropping the albedo. It's another contributing factor. And as we get more and more fires and boreal forests and stuff, then the sources of the black carbon get closer to the Arctic. Okay, now the southern hemisphere, lacking the industry, we see a totally different behavior. We see an increase of 0 0.07 degrees Celsius per decade over this period, and we see a rise of 0 0.09 from 1990 on. So it's pretty stable over the whole way here. So this is not modified by the black carbon, it's not modified by the sulfur dioxide in the aerosols, okay, because it's in the southern hemisphere, much less industry, huge expanses of ocean, okay? So this is a key factor. This is very strong evidence that, um, that this is an aerosol, uh, mostly sulfur dioxide in the aerosol problem, and this has changed into a, a reduction of the sulfur dioxide. Uh, so it's getting a lot cleaner in the Northern Hemisphere in terms of sulfur dioxide, a very rapid rise in temperature. Also a lot more black carbon, which has a positive component. Um, so this is why there's uncertainty in the net effect of aerosols on warming. This is why you know, one cannot make the claim that global dimming, if we shut off all industry, temperature would warm half a degree or four degrees or some other ridiculously high number. Um, if the most of the aerosols are the black carbon, then temperature would actually, the rate of temperature rise would actually decrease. Okay, so the picture is, the devil's always in the details. Okay, it's, it's uh, you know, but uh, it's important that we get to the root of this issue. It's complex. Um, you know, uh, I need to reread all of these papers and stuff, but I mean, this is pretty clear. This is pretty clear evidence. Um, so getting rid of the aerosol processes in the north, getting rid of industrial civilization, mostly in the northern hemisphere, would tend to lead us to this type of trend line rather than, you know, a drop and a an sharp increase and so on. It would lead to a, a, a general steady but smaller increase. Um, okay, what else do we have here? Okay, um, this is over the, so this is over the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere over land plus ocean. And now if we can tease out this data even more, so this is the northern hemisphere ocean only. So we also see the drop here and the rise here. The drop um, is, the, dro the rate of drop is larger and the rate of rise is smaller. Okay, um, so some of, the, some of the aerosol laden air is going over the oceans and causing the same effects to be seen in the northern hemisphere over the oceans. If we look at the northern hemisphere land only, um, then you can see um, an actual rise here and a rise here. And this rise here is even faster, okay, than any of the other numbers in the rise here than the rise in the previous one, okay? 0.24 to per decade. Um, and we actually get a rise over the land. So the black carbon effect in the aerosols over the land is a larger effect, it seems, in the sulfur dioxide uh, cooling in the, over the land. So this is very interesting data. Um, and uh, so we can see that things are really taking off here um, as we re 